Five Reasons the Roman Catholic Church is Apostate Like ancient Israel, the Church of Rome is a spiritual adulteress against God and has much blood on her hands. Here are five ways Rome is like a wayward harlot. Number one, the Roman Catholic Council of Trent in the 1500s officially anathematized or formally cursed the biblical gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that good works are the necessary fruit and evidence of justification. For example, in Canon 9 it says, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining of the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. So you see, cooperation is in view here. Faith alone is rejected, which is the biblical gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith alone, apart from our own merits, apart from earning and deserving salvation, or adding or minusing from the perfect, sufficient work of Jesus Christ, being united to him by a simple faith, a trust, repent and believe and be saved. This is the biblical doctrine of justification. Justification by faith alone rather than faith plus works. And you see here, cooperation is required in order to obtain the so-called grace of justification, but it can't be grace if you cooperate to earn it, to add good works to it. Cooperation for heaven is the essence of all false religion. Your God does his part and you do your part and hopefully you enter into heaven, but there's no guarantee. There's no powerful working of God. It's a prideful, self-righteous religion like all man-made religions. The heart of man is naturally pharisaical, desiring to merit or earn salvation in some way. Roman Catholics uh, try to deny it, but they in essence teach that you merit and earn and deserve your salvation. They may play with words, as they often do. They play around with words. They twist words. Uh, even though the Bible says it's a free gift of God, they say, yeah, sure, it's a free gift of God. We don't deserve it. We're sinners, right? But then you merit salvation. That is a complete contradiction. Canon 24, uh, if anyone saith that the justice received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that the said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema. So, you have to uh, somehow increase your justification through your own good works. Your merits, which are apparently enabled by God, which is just a very convenient way to avoid uh, many heresies uh, that the Bible contradicts, but instead of good works being the fruit and sign or evidence of justification already obtained, uh, it can cause and even preserve your salvation, justification, and sanctification. They muddle up justification and sanctification as if they are the same, completely contradicting the scriptures. So these two canons are just two examples, and they clearly contradict the word of God. For example, Ephesians 2, 4, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of yourselves, not cooperation. It is the gift of God. It's free. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't buy it. You don't get it for yourself by cooperating. Not of works lest any man should boast. Roman Catholics can boast in their own good works, can boast in their achievements, can boast that they merited salvation in some sense. Completely contradicting this passage, which is not about works of the law, it's not about the Mosaic law, but it's all works. For we, verse 10, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, or for good works, the purpose, the result, the evidence, the fruit, the sign of your justification, your right standing with God, your salvation, is you are the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus unto or for good works, for holiness, for newness of life, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We walk in them as a result of our salvation, not to get saved, not as the means of salvation, but the result that you are saved in Christ because you walk in good works, 
These good works don't add or minus anything to the perfect, sufficient, finished work of Jesus Christ, but they are the necessary result. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, the one that's not working, not striving to earn and deserve his salvation or his justification before God, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, not the righteous, not the godly, not the pious, not the one that deserves and has done all these things, but the ungodly, the undeserving, the unmeritorious, who only deserves condemnation for his sins. He simply believes his faith is counted for righteousness. It's credited unto him as righteousness. Faith alone, in contrast to work, it's to him that worketh not, who rests in Christ, rather than laboring to somehow, maybe, maybe not, get Christ in heaven. Notice also verses 2 and 6 of the same chapter. Abraham, before the law of Moses, and David after, were both justified and righteous apart from works. Any works, any merit, faith alone. Romans 4, 2, 4, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory or to boast, but not before God. Verse 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, or apart from works, God imputes righteousness unto the man. And it is by faith alone in this context. Abraham existed long before Moses was even born. Abraham was justified not by works, Paul says, but by faith alone. He simply believed and he was righteous. Before the law of Moses, it's to the one who does not work, but simply believes. This is before and after the law of Moses. Number two, like ancient Idolatrous Israel, she bows down to statues, images, and icons. God's word mocks idolatry in Psalm 135, Isaiah 42, and many other places. We're commanded to never create any graven image, pillar, or likeness to bow down to. And yet Rome makes foolish excuses for breaking the seventh, uh, second commandment over and over again without repentance. They even conveniently or perhaps deceitfully combine the second commandment against graven images with the first commandment acting like it's just one in the same commandment. Uh, monotheism, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The, the command against idolatry and graven images, this is exactly the same commandment. No, they act like the direct forbidding of graven images and likenesses to bow down to doesn't exist. They act like it is not the second commandment, but is all one and the same with the first commandment. This is, uh, in essence, deception. The second commandment is very important, very relevant. Repent for your breaking the second commandment, my friends. There is simply no way that God hates idolatry and the bowing down to statues, but then heartily approves of the Roman practice that looks and seems exactly the same. The Pope honors statues and icons that have ears but do not hear, eyes but do not see, feet but do not walk. He does not honor Christ, but is an antichrist, a deceiver and a man of lawlessness with a false Christian religion, promoting lies and idolatry. What's the difference between these popes and the man on the right worshipping his Hindu gods? Why is bowing down to a golden calf an abomination, Exodus 32? But bowing down to a statue of Mary or creating a queen of heaven shrine for her is a holy and pious thing that we should admire. We, it's not superstition. It's not the heathen pagan practice of idolatry, bowing down to lifeless, dead statues made with human hands. Number three, she has killed countless true saints of Christ. She is drunk with blood. Some estimate 50 to 70 million the apostate church of Rome has murdered over the years, and doubtless millions of Protestants and sincere followers of Christ, persecuting the church, persecuting the church. This is foretold in the scriptures. This anti-biblical church has been power-hungry and filled with bloodlust for centuries. Consider just one example, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, August 1572 where thousands of Protestants were murdered by the Roman Catholic Church within just one or two weeks, I believe. And it was approved and celebrated by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. The estimate of the number of deaths varies a lot, from 2,000, according to a Roman Catholic apologist, to a huge 70,000. Right? It's hard to know exactly, but let's assume the middle ground. Tens of thousands murdered within a couple of weeks. This is insanity. This is bloodlust. 
Rome, uh, John 16, 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. People, religious people will kill true believers, sincere followers of Jesus Christ, and think they are serving God in the process, think they're doing God glory and honor. This applies to the Church of Rome, and this applies to Islam as well. Killing and thinking they're doing God a service, that God is pleased with it. Revelation 17, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration or marveled with great amazement. Now, as we should know, many commentators believe this harlot, mother of harlots, this Babylon the Great, refers to the Roman Catholic Church herself. It may even refer to idolatrous Israel that put Jesus to death. But you see, the principle applies. This woman is filled with the blood of the saints, drunk with the martyrs of Jesus Christ. How many, how many millions has the Roman Catholic Church murdered? How many true saints who love the Lord, who are faithful to Jesus, were burnt at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church? Burned or drowned? All these things, cruel deaths. Revelation chapter 9 also says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Rome is essentially guilty of necromancy, a form of sorcery to the dead, praying to dead saints like they have power to answer. Popes are guilty of sexual immorality and robbery. The Church of Rome has been greedy and been extortionists for many years, many years. And before, the Pope usurps the authority of Jesus Christ and his titles. Standard art, uh, official titles given to Rome, even on the Vatican website, etc., include Bishop of Rome, Vicar of Christ, Successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, the Servant of Servants. So what is this supposed to mean? That Christ is not the Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church? Jesus is not the Servant of Servants? Or Absolute High Priest, as the word Pontiff can mean? And the Head of the Church? Jesus is not really the Head of the Church. He's been replaced by the Pope? No. The Pope is a usurper. He's never been appointed by Christ to rule. Scripture declares, quote, And he, present tense, is the head of the body, the church, referring to Jesus Christ. Not Peter, then living. He doesn't say Peter's the head of the church, by the way. He says Jesus is the head of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. No, wait, Paul, you're wrong. You're wrong. Peter is the head of the church, not Christ. Peter is the head of the church. Why are you speaking like this? Why are you speaking like this? Only Jesus Christ gets to make infallible declarations for the church. The Pope has no right, no power, and no ability. Jesus Christ is our great high priest, according to the book of Hebrews. Not uh, the Pope as the, the, the pontiff, uh, the supreme pontiff, not just any. The supreme pontiff of the universal church. It's nonsense. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Not the Pope, not the head of the church, not the apostle of all apostles and the servant of all servants. 
Notice First Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder or fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He never regarded himself as the Pope, nor did anyone else, including Paul, acknowledge him as the vicar of Christ with papal authority over all the apostles. He simply regarded himself as a minister, a servant, an apostle, an apostle equal to the apostle Paul and the other apostles. He's an elder, a fellow elder. Never the Pope, never the head of the church, or the servant of servants, or the leader of all the apostles. It's insanity to believe that the scriptures teach such a thing. So, number five, she denies the sufficiency of God's holy word. Tradition and ritual are more important to the church of Rome than God's infallible sufficient word. Their popes and councils change, add to and minus from the scriptures, contradict one another, and encourage abomination. They claim to be Bible-believing Christians, but they don't even preach or expound the word. Rather, they proof-text snippets in order to justify their man-made traditions, which clearly take preeminence in their religion, their spiritual life, their way of salvation. Their traditions take preeminence. They proof-text the scriptures. The scriptures are just a little add-on. But Jesus said, you invalidate and nullify the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Mark 7 verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But to continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Not some good works, all good works. The scriptures alone, as we, as we read here very clearly, not tradition, makes a person wise for salvation. And it is through a simple faith in Jesus Christ. Roman Catholics need to turn from their spiritual adultery and perverting of God's word and gospel before it's too late. And I say these with love, not hatred. And finally, the word perfect or complete, as well as thoroughly furnished in the Greek, can and has been defined by Greek scholars to mean sufficient. Pause and read the quotes on the screen if you'd like. The Bible is sufficient. We are justified by faith alone. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. Come to Jesus Christ. God bless you.